Well, hello there, modern man. I'm excited today because this is a long-awaited talk. I have a special, special guest, Professor Trish from Boston University. He's essentially the leading authority on research on andrology, testosterone, and everything you want to know about it. I've learned everything from him regarding testosterone and hormones and attended a stellar talk on in January and that's how we connected. So welcome, Professor Trace. Well, I, first of all, let me take uh, a moment and thank you for inviting me to participate in this conversation. And I hope I will be able to provide uh, a reasonable answer to your question. And I hope your audience can be patient with us and uh, just give us a chance to try to clarify some of the real issues that they may be confronting. For that, I am very happy to be here. Well, thank you for being here, and that's why we're here. I want to give you information from the top expert, not from internet, no nonsense stuff. This is from the expert, from their mouth themselves, and you, I'm sure you're going to get a, lots of value from that. So, Professor Trish, let's start. What is testosterone why should a man care about testosterone let me take a moment and just say something about testosterone physiology in a human health interestingly testosterone is a chemical messenger and this chemical messenger is needed like a fuel for many of our body cells our muscle cells needed to function testosterone blocks cells from going to become fat cells. Testosterone is needed for our central nervous system to make it function. Testosterone is important for our reproductive function. Testosterone is also important for our sexual function. Testosterone is important for our hair growth. Testosterone is important for keeping our skin healthy. Testosterone is keeping our liver healthy. It's amazing how important this chemical messenger, which I call a fuel, in terms of maintaining our overall health. And here's a very simple thing that I want to kind of give your audience. In 1907, farmers in this country found out that if you take testosterone away from the male chicken, they gain roughly more than two pounds of weight. So to sell more chicken, they actually do what they call cup on and they castrate their rooster in a young age. Within six weeks, the chicken become two pounds greater so they can sell it for more money and also is more juicier. I also want to tell your audience, if you have a pet male animal like a pet cat or a pet dog, which is male, and if it's neutered, you notice that in, in few years it gains more weight and become diabetic. So testosterone is an important hormone that regulates our metabolism. It regulates how our sugar in our body is metabolized. It regulates how fat in our body is utilized. It regulates how we maintain protein. So testosterone is a metabolic hormone, is a sexual hormone, it's a vascular hormone, and in my view, it's also a mental hormone. Because recently there was quite a few studies that says as you grow a little older and your testosterone goes down, your chances of getting dementia and Alzheimer's disease is very high. So testosterone is really a fuel for the body. And once that fuel in the tank becomes less and less and less, we're going to become a bit more frail and a bit more fatty. We all get buff bellies and we're not going to be able to work as fast and we're not going to be asleep as well and uh, we're going to be fatigued here and there and we're going to be forgetful so that's my message about the testosterone now the interesting thing in my view is that whether it's uh, nature or big powers or whatever i don't want to get into any of that the body has a manufacturing plant called the testes and it's there to produce this hormone day in and day out i don't believe if it's not important physiologically to keep our health why do we need this organ pumping testosterone? Of course, when we're young in our 20s and 30s, you know, we are athletes and we do all kind of whatever. But as we grow the order in our late 50, early 60, and 70, you know, the testes are still there, but the cells that make the testosterone become fewer and their ability to manufacture this efficiently is less. 
And that's why as we get older, we actually get much more flare and get frail and we get both bellies. We, we call it metabolic syndrome and we get uh, loss of our muscle and so forth. So testosterone is an important metabolic and vascular hormone that human body and our overall health depends on it. So it's not just for sex because oftentimes testosterone, a male sex drive and getting erection, all that. So it is for your mind, it is for your mood, it helps with your bones, it helps with your heart, it helps build muscle, it even will control your fat as well too. And like you said earlier, is that if you have less testosterone, you're going to gain a little bit of weight as you had mentioned about the rooster. So having said that, I thought about something. Why does the testicle, which makes testosterone, other than aging, what happened to the testicle that as you age, you make less? There was really, really some nice studies in the animal model, and they found out there are two things. One, the Leydig, there's a cell called Leydig cell. They give it a name because the guy who discovered This cell is the place where testosterone is manufactured. As we grow older, we lose about 40% of these cells. So basically this manufacturing gland loses 40% of its capacity. That's number one. The other thing, the way testosterone is made, it needs a signal from our brain. So our brain sends a signal to the test that says, you need to make testosterone. With age, that signal becomes a little fuzzy. The lytic cells don't really respond to that signal as good. So there are two things. One, we lose 40% of the cells. Second, the signal that activates the cells, the cells don't respond to it as good as they would. And that's why with age, we actually lose, we lose roughly testosterone about one to 2% per year. What age does that start? What age does that start? It starts, uh, it's, it starts, by the way, it starts with age 40 and goes on 1% per year. And this is documented in uh, many, many human studies. I mean, it's well documented, but here's what I want to say something. Our body is a beautiful machine and our body is a beautiful machine because it wants to make sure nothing goes out of place. So we have a protein called sex hormone binding globuli, and this protein keeps the testosterone in circulation. And when the cells need it, it can come off and it gives it to the cell. Unfortunately, as we grow older, the liver makes a little bit more of this protein, which is called sex hormone binding globuli, and it sponges the testosterone. So even if we're making just about, some of it is captured with this protein and it's not available to be active physiologically to make the cell function as we see it. So as the liver makes more of this protein and as we grow older, let's assume you have $100,000 in, in your saving account, but the bank puts that you can only take 1%, the other 90% you can't. So you do have $100,000, but you cannot go out and take 90,000 and buy a new sports car. So this sex hormone binding globally sponges the testosterone, so it's not available to the cells to function. It's not available to the muscle cell, to the liver cell, to the brain cell, to the you know penile cell, to what have you. And unfortunately, that's where there's the terminology, and I'm sure people in Google, which is fine. There's something called total testosterone levels, means the testosterone in the blood, but only the free fraction, the one that is not bound to sex hormone binding globulin, and it's not bound to other proteins, is the one that really acts physiologically. That's the real money. It's what you have uh. in your pocket. It's what you have in your pocket to buy cappuccino with is your money. The other is saving account. <laughs> the bank put whatever clothes in it and you can't withdraw it. That's exactly what happens. Right. And that led me to this question. And I wonder in myself, so it's the free testosterone that is active and yes. the total testosterone also include the one that is bound to the protein called sex hormone uh, binding globulin or SHBG. So yes. why is it all the study always quote total testosterone, total testosterone, then they don't mention free testosterone as well because most studies you read, they always mention total testosterone. Very simple fact. The simple fact is that it's easy to measure total testosterone. It's not easy to measure free testosterone. 
To measure free testosterone, you have to use one or two methods. One called equilibrium dialysis, which requires a lot of labor, a lot of time. It's probably the gold standard, but it's too expensive. You as a physician in a hospital and you order blood tests and you order free testosterone, the hospital would rather pay $15 for tests rather than $200 for tests. And it take, it's a quicker, you can get it stat within 24 hours. The other one will take maybe two to three days or a week or so. The, one problem is the analysis of pre versus total testosterone. It's so easy to measure total testosterone. It's really complex to measure free testosterone. The other analytical tool is called gas liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, which is big terms. Basically, you have to do serious, refined analytical procedure that takes complex methods and lots of experience and it's very expensive the tools are very expensive too so the equilibrium dialysis and the mass spectrometry are the two tools you can measure free testosterone total testosterone is easily measured by radium USA. now someone in belgium many years ago says you don't really have to go to equilibrium dialysis you don't have to do mass spectrometry what you can do there is a formula since we know the affinity for the sex hormone binding globulin, and we know the affinity for serum albumin, and we know all these kinetics, we can just develop an equation and a calculator. And so there is a calculator which you can find in the web. If you have total testosterone and sex hormone binding globulin, you can find what they call testosterone free index, which is approximation of, it's not exactly as free testosterone, but it's an approximation. And many studies says it's reasonable. It's basically like currency exchange between the American dollar and the Canadian dollar. You lose few cents, but you're not going to lose much. But I agree with you, many of the published studies use total testosterone. But the honest way of thinking, look at the biology. The cells do not see the sex hormone binding globulin testosterone bound. They don't see that. They can only access the free testosterone. So your muscle cell, your liver cell, your brain cell, your whatever kidney cell, whatever other cell that is testosterone, they cannot see the bound one. They can only see the fraction, which is free. And if there is less free, although you may have total a lot, but it's all bound to sex hormone like globally, if you have fewer free, then you're going to be androgen deficient. You're going to be testosterone deficient. And there is a, a very nice study by a young woman of Belgium. She's a very smart. I just met her last week at our meeting and she published a very nice study and I'm gonna go through it, not the whole thing, just simply. She took men which has total testosterone in the normal range and free testosterone in the normal range. Then she took a bunch of men where their total testosterone is the normal range, but their free testosterone is low. She took a third group of men where their normal testosterone is below the normal range, but their free testosterone is in the normal range. And then they evaluated their sexual function, this, this, a whole bunch of categories. And guess what? If your testosterone both total and free in the normal, you are fine. You check everything nicely. But if you have normal total testosterone, but low free testosterone, you have all the symptoms of hypogonadism. Depression, bad, lousy mood, low energy, fatigue, lethargy, sexual dysfunction, and on and on. Interestingly, those who have low total testosterone, but normal free testosterone, they're okay. So it's the free testosterone that matters. It's not the total testosterone. What? The only so, reason as a biochemist, I believe in that, because the cells can only sense what touches them, not something in a box somewhere where they cannot reach it, basically. Right. So essentially, if you need some quick evaluation of total of testosterone, you can just get the total testosterone mm -hmm. and the SHBG and albumin, I believe. Yeah. And then you plug it into the formula and you can really get free testosterone levels, Correct. which you Correct. said maybe plus or minus 10%, right? Yeah. yeah. It's validated. It's reliable enough. Yes. It's reliable enough. So that's good. That's really good to know because yeah. you're absolutely right. Because when I order testosterone, it takes like about three to four days to get the free testosterone back. And it does bring a little bit of higher cost to the blood work. So I love that explanation, what you said and what you said. So it's the free testosterone that matters. Yes. So listeners, just know that if you are getting your testosterone level checked, 
make sure you get the total and the free if the doctor can order it. If not, you can calculate it. But as long as your doctor order SHBG, sex hormone mm -hmm. binding globulin, and albumin, and you can certainly Google testosterone calculator. And I'll put that link in the show notes today as well. So having said that, I learned something so interesting. Your talk was that each man has a different receptor and that is how he responds differently to different levels of testosterone. So can you kind of explain that to us and how that can kind of present clinically? Let me make it clear. I want to correct something. I mean, I want to make sure. So testosterone gets into the target cell, whatever cell that needs it. Once it gets to the target cell, testosterone have a choice. Either get hugged by the androgen receptor, captured and hugged by the androgen receptor, or it can get converted into a really much stronger androgen called dihydrotestosterone. Dihydrotestosterone gets a better hug and a much closer hug with the receptor. What I said that we all have androgen receptor. Every man has androgen receptor in many of his tissues and cells. The question is the androgen receptor in one person is not the same in the other person because there's something at the beginning of the receptor gene that for some it's more sensitive, for others it's medium sensitive, for others it's a less sensitive. Myself and my cousin, we both have the androgen receptor and we both respond to testosterone, but I may respond better than my cousin because I have a short tail at my receptor. He has a longer tail at his receptor, and therefore the response is different. He may require higher testosterone level than me because my receptor is more responsive. And that's what I really meant with that. So we all have the androgen receptor. So the androgen receptor is the same, except for some of us, our, the androgen receptor is very sensitive and produces much more biological effect for others the receptor is there, but it requires a much more push. It requires much more oomph to reach the same level. And this is uh, because the gene for the androgen receptor from one person to another has a, a tail in its uh, DNA that is transcribed into RNA and then into protein. And this makes the receptor either very sensitive, moderately sensitive, or less sensitive. That's an excellent explanation there. So. Having said that, what that means is that every man's sweet spot for their testosterone is different. And that's, that's what correct. we see clinically, is that's that correct. some of my patients do well on total testosterone mm -hmm. at 500 level, and some need 700, and some need to be even in the 800 range exactly. to exactly. feel better. But you have to understand that individuality of the androgen receptor and then, but what I see sometimes is that patient come in and the uh, clinic, they just totally give them a bunch of testosterone to drive their level so high that it's super physiologic or really above the range they should be. And they actually start to feel worse. So testosterone is the sweet spot. So if you give too little, you don't feel well. You like give too much, you don't feel well either. Yeah. I have to agree with you hundred percent on this. I think we have to really appreciate the following. Biology is a very fascinating phenomena. Think of it, every, every, everyone has his own engine with his own fuel tank with how many cylinders. Some of us has four cylinders, some of us have six cylinders, some of us eight cylinders. I don't know if there's anything called four cylinder. That's and not... therefore each of us have. But I agree with you on the sense that, so for some men, the total testosterone levels of 350 to 400 is fine. They run smoothly like a clock, but for others, 350 to 400, they are lethargic, they fatigue, they have no desire, no libido. You put them at 650 and they bust. But for others, they need a little, even a little bit more. So unfortunately, and I want to make sure I don't criticize anyone in particular, our clinical community have gotten something wrong. Is that there is a cutoff point and this cutoff point should fit everybody. Is that 350 nanograms per deciliter is the cutoff point. I think this is really wrong. And the reason it is wrong, because they don't take into account anything about differences in the androgen receptor sensitivity. And 
I want to address the other comorbidities that people might have. You know, people might have metabolic syndrome. People might have a bit of vascular disease. We have a bit of pre-diabetic diet. You take these two things together and no two people are the same when you will come to that. So there is something simply said, why can't physician titrate? Why can't they titrate? They can give their patients something to give them up for 50. And six weeks later, have them come back and see if they're doing one and six and for 50, that's fine. But if not, titrate it up a little and titrate it up to the point where they said, it's working and then keep it at that or titrate it down if if you start them on 850 and they say hey what's things are crazy say let's bring it down unfortunately the clinical literature is ambiguous about this issue because this number of 350 nanogram per deciliter that the fda uses to approve or lack thereof formulation what have you it's really not a scientific number it has no basis in science it has never been substantiated there's not a single study that document anything about 350 is unnecessary or anything below 350s this is a human experiment i think physician and patient should have a conversation and should titrate start at the point and titrate up or titrate down until you find your happy hour and stay with that what it really means is that if you're feeling the low energy, you're gaining weight, you have low desire and affecting your erection and your level is 400, it may just be that you're androgen deficient or low testosterone yes. and you're symptomatic. Yes. But yeah. if the doctor ordered your total testosterone and he said you're normal, that not necessarily mean you're normal. And that really bothers me because I have been an advocate for hormone replacement therapy for symptoms. And so having said that, you know, if you're not feeling well and you have the symptom, get treated even though you are within range. But unfortunately, you know, insurance company do not consider you low testosterone or hypogonadal unless you are below 300. But that's a different issue. Where did 300, 900 come from? Where did that well, come it's, from it's, arbitrarily? It's a, it's a truly a fascinating story. I have to be careful because I don't want to get... So somewhere in the early 1980, a pharmaceutical company went to the FDA to get approval and they brought their advisors with them. And the FDA asked the question, so where we consider hypogonada, where we consider eugonada? And the company advisor looked at each other and one of the individuals who was uh, advising this company put this number out, 300. It's absolutely uh, driven from the air no scientific basis, not on a publication, not on a clinical trial. This is a true story, by the way. I don't have the prerogative to put names or whatever, but that's how it came from. It's basically me saying, poverty line should be anyone who earns $100 a day. But if you live in New York, earning $100 a day, it doesn't get you on the subway. Yeah. That's wow. the problem with that number. Unfortunately, insurance company love it, because they can have make your life difficult for physician authorization because they say, well, if, if he has uh, 305, he's above the 300, we're not going to approve his treatment or we're not going to approve this and that. This is really not scientifically evident. This is not clinically evident. It should never be that way. You know, I, I'm just going to go back to the 1940-50 where they did not have a testosterone assay. They did not have a 300 number. They treated based on symptoms and their patient come back and says, thank you. And doctor says, we've seen beautiful results because there is no magic number to worry about. It's about treatment of symptoms. Unfortunately, nowadays we got stuck with this number as a currency that, you know, if you are in uh, Oshkosh Bagash in Wisconsin, $100 a day is great. But if you are yeah. in New York City, $100 a day doesn't get you coffee and sandwich. That is amazing. So it would just pull out the air in 1980 at a meeting. It was Correct. just some arbitrary number. It's not based upon randomized controlled trial, no, level one no, research no. or anything. But no, why does no. it stick all these years? Why is it on your laboratory test? Why is it like the gold standard now? Unfortunately, I'm not going to criticize anybody. No one wants to pick a fight with a federal organization like the FDA and have them change that because they move as slow as a turtle and they're not going to do it at this point. But the honest to goodness is that there's absolutely no scientific study 
that determine 300 is the magic value or the magic number. It's purely pulled from the air in a given moment spontaneously and ever since it became the thing that everybody looks for. What about the 900, the high ceiling? Does that have a scientific you, you know, basis? Uh, I want to quote a colleague of mine from Germany who did a very beautiful study and he shows that it's a ladder and he says when testosterone drops beyond this step you have erectile dysfunction when it drops below this step you have loss of libido when it drops below this step you get tea fatigue and lethargy when you go below this step you start getting a pot belly what he showed in it and his clinician and this is data from his clinic showing that different level of testosterone affects various physiological processes differently and therefore we may need a range between you know, 600 and 850 to have everything working okay. Otherwise, think about it, your power went out and you do have a, a battery in your garage. If you hook it to your stove to cook, you're not gonna be able to have your TV on. But if you hook it to your TV and your computer, you're not gonna be able to have your water pump goes on. So I think the idea that 350 is a magic number that should be adequate to power this beautiful machine it's a no, no. I am absolutely against this whole concept that this magic number, which has no evidence attached to it, should be the basis of medical treatment. I think it should be, did your symptom resolve if you titrate up or you titrate down? That should be the way clinician pursue this. Right. I love that. So let's talk a little bit about controversy. You and I, there's no controversy, but still, you hear this a lot. And you start somebody on testosterone, the primary care doctor would say, oh no, testosterone caused prostate cancer. You're not a candidate for that. So let's just come out and just say that that is not true, but still, it's still prevalent today. And so let's start dispelling that myth that testosterone do not cause prostate cancer and why. I'm glad you brought this issue because it's important. You know, Charles Huggins won the Nobel Prize in 1960 because he showed that in one of his patients in 1941, it's a patient who was castrated, means his testes were removed, and he was given androgen, and he already know that he was castrated because he has metastatic prostate cancer. And if you give him back testosterone, his prostate cancer continued to grow. Let's look at this very briefly in, in a good perspective. A, Huggins, when he castrated this patient, he castrated him to alleviate his pain from prostate cancer. But when he gave him testosterone back, the, the cancer grew again. That does not say to anyone that testosterone itself was the cancer. All what it says that the prostate cancer cell and the normal prostate cancer cell, they both use testosterone as a fuel to grow. This is not a magic thing. Unfortunately, for almost three or four decades since, every clinician was trained that testosterone is like a, a gasoline for a fire for males. So testosterone is gonna cause prostate cancer. Huggins never said testosterone causes prostate cancer. Huggins says testosterone when given to a man who has metastatic prostate cancer and he was deprived from testosterone, his cancer will grow. It took three decades of a lot of people. Uh, I think one I should mention because I think he was single-handedly defining this is Dr. Abraham Morgantara. But let me take you to a very important recent finding. There's something called the Traverse Trial. The Traverse Trial is mandated by the FDA. The FDA asked all the testosterone manufacturers in the United States that they have to do a trial to show that testosterone is safe for cardiovascular disease. Well, those who did the trial says, why just do uh, safety for cardiovascular disease? S show safety for cardiovascular disease, for prostate cancer, and whatever other benefits. Here is the good news, and here's the great news. So this study, which was published this year, and it's a large study, it's 5,000 men, so it's not, and it's up to four years. They showed that testosterone did not increase the incidence of prostate cancer at all. Testosterone did not increase the incidence of prostate cancer at all. It did not change benign prostatic hypertrophy either. It did not make the prostate grow either. 
It did not change much of increasing uh, process-specific antigen. It did not change anything about urinary flow. That means testosterone in this study, which is the largest study today, and it's mandated by the FDA, shows that there is no prostate risk, there is no urinary retention risk, there is no urinary flow risk. So this is, to me, the lid is on the coffin and it's nailed. Except for some people, yes, the lid is on the coffin and it's nailed, but there is no purpose in that. Some people will still believe that testosterone is dangerous for prostate cancer. You cannot go and train these people. If you were trained in the early 1970 and early 1980, you would have lecture from your professor, from your chief resident, from yeah. your program director, from your chairman, that testosterone causes prostate cancer. How you undo that learning? How do you undo all that learning, which was not real? It's not easy. So these people, unfortunately, believe in the authority and they stuck and we're not gonna change their minds. I'm just hoping that the new generation of physician will be able to read a study like this published in 2024 called the Traverse Trial, and they will see out in 5,000 men, there were only a few cases, and this is a randomized control trial, that the prostate cancer in both groups, the control which never seen testosterone and the treated group have the same incidence, nothing different. This tells me that testosterone have nothing to do with prostate cancer. No one has ever demonstrated if you give testosterone, you actually initiate cancer. Now, Huggins experiment is still valid. There are already metastasized prostate cancer. You give testosterone, it's energy source, it's going to use that energy source to grow. That's not a surprise. In That's fact, right. In fact, I just want to add something very interesting. There's a guy in John Hopkins who does something very, very, very interesting called bipolar treatment of metastatic prostate cancer. What he does, he takes these patients and put them in androgen deprivation therapy means they have no testosterone for a number of weeks. But then he comes and he gives them a high dose possible of testosterone. And guess what? Based on the outcome of that study with beautiful androgen, he actually, the cancer regresses by this bipolar treatment. So if testosterone actually is a fuel for fire, why this guy when they give them this mega dose of testosterone, their prostate cancer doesn't become larger than a basketball. It doesn't. So people have to really appreciate that science is a very interesting thing. And as we're having this discussion, science lives and dies by discussion. The moment we stop having discussion, there's no science. So we have to continue to have this discussion. But the evidence is accumulating gradually and with a great deal of evidence that testosterone is not a carcinogen. It does not cause cancer. Absolutely. And I'm actually going to put the resource for that Traverse trial in the show note. So what that means is, men, if you're on testosterone, it is changing your quality of life, helping you live your life better. And if a doctor tells you, you need to get off of it because it caused prostate cancer, what you do is you just cite this study, the Traverse trial, and have them read that. Maybe that will change your mind. Obviously, you can't change the doctor's opinion, but you can certainly give them a research paper that will cite that, hey, it doesn't say that. Let the research show itself because it makes me sad to see patients doing really well and then their doctors say, oh no, it caused prostate cancer. You shouldn't be on it. It caused heart attacks even, and you're at risk of getting a heart attack. You need to get off of it. And then they get off of it and they feel horrible. So now, you know, you can use this research study to show that to your doctor and advocate for yourself. What Dr. Professor Tresh said is that you can't change everybody. If they've been trained in the 1980s or so, that was the prevalent teaching at that time. But that's when I was trained. That's when Dr. A. Morgan Toller was trained. But we change, you know, we change our clinical treatment based upon research and based upon how our patients are responding. When I was 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. I have the highest testosterone in my body physiologically, right? I didn't get a prostate cancer. So why prostate cancer takes place in the late 60, early 70, when the testosterone is really low? So for anyone who can think just carefully, if testosterone causes prostate cancer, every kid in college in 20 should be having prostate cancer. And every man in his 80s should have no prostate cancer because the levels 
one is way up high one is low so it's not the testosterone it's absolutely testosterone does not cause prostate cancer it's really a screwed up vision unfortunately people misinterpreted Hagen's observation as testosterone causes prostate cancer in reality it doesn't in fact most of the prostate cancer takes place when the testosterone levels begin to go down not when they begin to go up so if this is the case why can't be you know and i want to say that and we discussed this with a dr morgan tyler was that Huggins studies was based upon two it was like three patients that he looked at and then one dropped out and then two based upon two patients that's correct uh, and that's where all this came from that's and correct it's just fascinating to me what right? this study is such a hallmark based upon two patients and then what you said the level 300 testosterone was based upon somebody blurbing it out at a meeting the fda but yet we use that now as the gold standard now compare that to traverse trial where they look at 5,000 men multi-center and randomized control trial too yeah, that's right correct. That's yeah correct. so that's the highest level of research you can get and that's like the cadillac of the cadillac of research study so Let's nail that coffin down to testosterone is safe for men if you have symptoms and if you feel better on testosterone, you should not stop your testosterone therapy. If you have prostate cancer, then that's a discussion you need to have with your doctor, whether you need to continue testosterone or not. And, you know, actually follow Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler. He has treated patients even with prostate cancer with testosterone, but close monitoring, close yes. monitoring yes. at that time. So I'm not going to touch upon that, but I want to touch upon that it is safe. And I love how you correlate that. Hey, you know, if high level testosterone cause prostate cancer, then all 20 year olds should have prostate cancer, right? I want to add one thing. Sure. This Traverse study also told us one thing, and I'll make it very brief. The whole garbage, which was took place for the last 10 years, that testosterone causes heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular mortality, is also put to rest because this very same Traverse trial, which was mandated by the FDA for this specific reason, is telling us the following. There was no difference in men getting testosterone and men not getting testosterone when it comes to stroke, heart attack and uh, death from cardiovascular disease. So hopefully, once again, the nail is in the coffin with the corpus in that this issue should never resurface again. The evidence is so conclusive that testosterone does not cause cardiovascular disease, does not increase cardiovascular disease. If any, testosterone has a great deal of benefit when it comes to improving vascular health. I just don't want to miss the opportunity to have your audience realize that this whole thing, by the way, this was the reason that the FDA mandated this study, is there were there a few studies in 2010, 2013, and 2014, trying testosterone causes men to drop dead, the New York Times reported on it, Washington Post reported on it, CNN, NBC, ABC, every other news media. But guess what? Now we have the Traverse trial since this is not real, I did not see much news about this. It's very hush quiet. Where is NBC, ABC, BBC, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street, whatever? Why can't they come out and say testosterone is safe for men? It does not cause or increase the risk of vascular disease. Please go ahead and do it. Communicate to your community that you made a boo in 2014, 2015, and you want to correct that boo It's okay. We all admit our faults. I don't know, none of them was doing that. I don't see anywhere where this is publicized. Why? Because the evidence says we should not fear any longer this. But why cannot be this communicated to the lay people? Why this is not communicated to the average person walking the street? Only when, the, you know, it said, if it bleeds, it bleeds. You know, if, if there's an accident or a fire, traffic jams, yeah. But if we're running smoothly, nobody cares. You know, I, there's a saying, which is not mine. Nobody notices when the elevator is running. Everybody knows when the elevator stops. The yeah. same thing here. When there is bad news, every news media wants to take it because emotionally connect. But when there is good news, why not bring the good news to us? Right, absolutely. I mean, I, I can insert that, you know, there was a research paper that came out in 30 minutes of exercise as effective as taking a Viagra for erectile dysfunction. 
but that was Barry. That was never yeah. on yeah. CNN or anything like that. And then there was this a study that showed that Viagra can help with Alzheimer's, and that was everywhere. Everywhere, yeah, uh, yeah. Everybody was quoting it to me. You asked me a very important question, and very passionate about that question. I don't know how much time we have, but I'll do my best to summarize it. First of all, testosterone is not a male sex hormone. Testosterone is a human hormone. Testosterone, women make actually much more testosterone than they make estrogen. Every gynecologist, every endocrinologist, every primary care physician thinks estrogen are important for women, but not androgen. Why don't they realize that you cannot make estrogen unless you have androgen? You have to make testosterone first before you make estradiol. But they completely dismiss that testosterone is important for women. Only estrogen is important for women. This story has to be unraveled. This has to be told that testosterone is a human hormone and it has a physiological role in women's health as much as in men's health. This yeah. is an important topic and this is an important issue, but unfortunately, I'm not gonna be the person who throw uh, water on everybody's uh, party. We were bombarded with studies like the Women Health Initiative, which made it difficult to talk about hormones in women. Then we were bombarded by the endocrine society saying, do not diagnose, don't treat women with testosterone deficiency. Then came the FDA, which will never approve testosterone for women. And our educational system, our clinical educational system, does not support training young men and women in medicine to understand the role of testosterone in women. You take these four roadblocks, and I'm not surprised why this topic is hush-hush. But for me, this is not hush-hush. There is scientific and clinical evidence, beginning with 1940 until now. That testosterone is an important hormone in women, not only just for reproduction, but for maintaining physical health, mental health, reproductive health, sexual health, etc., etc. And these studies are out there. Why people don't see them, I don't really know. I mean, you know, there is a society called uh, International Society of Study of Women's Sexual Health called ISWISH, and they do their darn best to try to communicate this message, and they meet once a year. They have really brilliant people, Susan Davis, Jim Simons, uh, Noel Kim, Aaron Goldstein, and I can name many, many very bright people. But somehow this message is not resonating with the primary care, with gynecologists, with the endocrinologists, what have you. In fact, you know, God forbid, if I'm a woman and my mid 30 or late 30, and I go to see my gynecologist and tell them like this, this is just, oh, it's all in your head. Why is it not in my head? What's wrong to do a little bit of a hormone battle and check my hormone levels? And if I am deficient in testosterone, why couldn't I get a supplementation? Wow, there's no FDA approval for testosterone for women. The Women Health Initiative says uh, don't give hormones to women. You know, the Endocrine Society told us don't even test, don't diagnose, don't treat, don't even bother. When are we going to change that? I don't really know. But we need to fight, we need to have a voice, we need to have a platform. Yeah. I tell Cecilia, I've done really interesting work in my lab, in the animal model, not in the person because I'm not a clinician, where testosterone is very important for maintaining the vagina, the labia minora, the vestibule, the clitoris. It's important for sexual arousal. The study that I was funded is to look at the importance of testosterone in female sexual arousal function, and that's what I'm saying. We see beautiful results. We see a dramatic results. Unfortunately, if you go anywhere and give a talk about this, you get dismissed because this is important. The FDA would approve testosterone. You know how many clinical, there's so many clinical trials on testosterone therapy in women by Susan Davis, by Jane Schifrin, by Ike and Emio, many, many enlist, and they all demonstrate improvement uh, from well being to sexual function, extra, extra, extra. So why do we have all this knowledge, but we bury it in the mattress? Why it's not in the clinical realm? I don't really know. I lack the uh, knowledge of how to do advocacy, how to, maybe we need people, patients to come to the doctor and say, look, I can bring you 20 clinical trials that say this is good for me. Why are you telling me it's on my head? I, maybe when we get to the point, that's when the conversion might take place. I think before that, our training system by the way, let me make a, a bold example. Let me assume that I'm a registered nurse. I've never been trained to talk to another person with sexual function. It's embarrassing for me to talk about it. I'm not so sure how to start the conversation. 
I thought I said, you know what, don't worry about it. Maybe it's just uh, some... We are not ready to have this conversation. And I think really this is a big, big issue in a clinical medicine. We oh, don't I, have it. Right. Right. I, it's, I well, it's, any... it's not a vital sign that we ask. It's not like temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, you know, like, yeah, oh, yeah. how's your sexual function? It should be probably the fifth or the sixth vital yeah. sign. So having said that, I want to stress a couple points that you said to our listener that women actually in your body had higher testosterone level than even estrogen and progesterone and that it affects in the woman body as much as the man and all the the, from the brain, the heart, the circulation, the body fat, the muscle mass, protecting the bones and everything else as well too. But the, another sad part, and I want to bring this up, is that yes, we you have testosterone, various type of testosterone formulation for men. We don't have a testosterone for women at this point. Yeah, zero. zero. And if women need to have testosterone, we have to use it from a man's product and titrate the concentration down according to her so you know you either have to use the testosterone gel that you for men or testosterone injection or even a gel but then you have to titrate it down that's really sad because if you can have the product for men and women have testosterone level as well but yet women have zero testosterone product but that's another area that we're not going to touch it's, on it's, it's a, this, <laughs> this needs a separate discussion by itself yeah right i wanted to raise that issue not a lot of women i mean a lot of women still live with the stigma of the you know women health initiative that was in what 2013 that says it's that, a 2002 oh, it's a oh, 2000, 2002 yeah. yeah 2002 22 years ago that said that indicated that estrogen maybe play a role in breast cancer but that since had been you know again refuted and said yes. that it was poorly done and it was oral estrogen and not topical estrogen it was uh, synthetic so it had been counter but yet the thing is still pervade i have more women telling me than men that hey i put them on hormone replacement therapy with testosterone and estrogen and their doctors oh do you need to get off of it? it's gonna cause you breast cancer it doesn't do anything at all just get off of it and they believe they're and they come back and they're crying to me and say my doctor tells me that you tell me that i don't know who to believe to be honest with you i think this is a key point i'm glad you highlighted is that i think we need and I don't want to use the word revolution, but it may be a revolution in our clinical training of young people that unfortunately many believe in the authorities such as the Women Health Study. But then let me share with you a statement from Dr. Henry Berger, who is Australian. He said the Women Health Initiative is nothing but a war on women's health. Now he's a clinician, he's an endocrinologist. He saw that it set women's health back almost 50 years. Why do we do that? I don't know. By the way, the authors of the Women Health Study came in 2013 and says, yeah, there's a lot of problem with the way the study is uh, reported and we regret this, but it's too late. The damage is done. Unfortunately, the damage is done, but we don't have a new steps to kind of begin to train and retrain young people in medicine that forget about that. It's the new evidence. It's what we have today. But unfortunately, they still get training from their prior higher authority and therefore the chain is still linked absolutely and if you're a woman listening to this or a man if you have a partner listening to this you want to find out more about it, there are several urologists like dr rachel rubin dr keller casperson if i miss anybody else and there's one more that you know really is an advocate for women hormone replacement therapies but especially for estrogen so let's move on to say i want to touch upon like how is testosterone even preventative now? Let's move from bad to good to now prevention. Now, let's do that way. We can move on forward in saying that there's a reason why testosterone there in your body in the first place. I want to be very careful. This is a very difficult issue to put in simple words. Prevention means you're doing prophylactic. I don't want to talk anything that's prophylactic. Whether you are 27, or 77, if your hormone panel showing that you have low testosterone for whatever reason, it could be inflammation, it could be uh, genetic, it could be whatever, 
I think you should have your hormone panel replaced to the physiological level, not to be super high output, but to the physiological level. I'm very careful. I would not want to do anything called the preventative because this is, you don't take hormone for lifestyle. I would never encourage that. I honestly believe that irrespective of your age, if you do experience serious symptoms, physically, psychologically, or sexually, go see your doctor. Make sure that they do the entire hormone battle, testosterone, free testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, DHT, prolactin, extra, extra. And if the banner comes and you are everything all set, then it could be something else. But if in that manner you are wobbling on the borderline, there is nothing wrong with having something to take to maintain your health. Because the order preventative is like someone is taking supplement of vitamin D or vitamin E or whatever. I don't want to use the word preventative because preventative, I think we should switch to a different topic. Lifestyle. That's a preventative. Because if you lose 15% of your body weight, you can increase your testosterone by about 20 to 30%. I love that. And thank you for clarifying that. Yes, it's not taking testosterone to prevent when you're young. You don't need it. But it's really something to think about if you are, like you said, on the borderline and if you feel that you need something a little extra. And I totally agree with you. It's, it's lifestyle. It's the number one for prevention yeah. and for increasing testosterone naturally. Let me say this. This is an example. It's not my example. It's a colleague of mine. God bless him. He passed away. But he was a terrific uh, endocrinologist and I learned a lot from him. He was a, a mentor and a brother to me. He did a study, which is a fascinating study. And he studied people and their stress. So let's assume, let's assume I am a salesperson and I have to drive from New York to New Jersey, to Maryland, to Washington DC, to Boston, wherever. I have two kids and a wife. I spend eight hours on the road. I come home tired. I have to have a glass of wine to put my mind or whatever. I'm stressed like no tomorrow. I'm only 27 years old. My testosterone is so low. Why? Because I'm stressed. And if I'm stressed, my sympathetic system is telling my hypogonadal pituitary access, shut the damn thing off. And he has a thousand men in this study. And it turns out stress levels can bring your testosterone down. You can be 30 years old or 27 or 25 or 41. And unfortunately, a physician think if you're not 75, why do we even want to bother your testosterone levels? So our lifestyle, whether it's work habits, sleep habits, diet habits are really important to what we do and what we don't. And unfortunately, what I want to say is that if you have a stressful lifestyle or a sedentary lifestyle, because sedentary lifestyle, especially if you take hamburger and french fries and running from one place to the next because you don't have time to eat a reasonable and your sugar is going up and your salt is going up, very soon you're going to have, unfortunately, uh, metabolic syndrome or obesity or diabetes and add to it if you drink a little bit more alcohol, if you're trying to suppress your stress by a cigarette or two, your inflammation levels goes up the roof, your hyperglycemia is going to bust and you become pre-diabetic or even diabetic, your insulin resistance is going to gradually move up the ladder and your lipid profile is going to get screwed up and it's going to always get habit. You're going to be overweight or obese or metabolic syndrome. You're going to be pre-diabetes. Maybe you can become a frank diabetic and you are in trouble. And guess what happens with all of that? Your vascular heart is going to be kaput because your blood vessels can handle that. And if your blood vessels can handle that, think of the little teeny blood vessels in the penis, which we call helicine, arterioli, and whatever. They're going to be clogged and they're not going to allow blood flow to get in and when you're hoping for a good uh, sexual activity and a good eruption, it's not going to happen because your lifestyle created this issue and now you are at a high risk of erectile dysfunction. So lifestyle is important, not just by lowering testosterone, but by maintaining an overall physical, physiological, vascular and mental health. You need all of this, otherwise you don't have anything. What are natural ways that a man can increase his testosterone? You know, you mentioned, all right, let me ask you that. So diet, exercise, a stress reduction and sleep and Mediterranean diet, you know, for increasing it naturally, exercise. What type of exercise particularly? What duration, I, I, how I, often? I'm, I'm going to be very honest. I'm not going to lie to anyone. I am not an expert on exercise. I think you need a 30 to 45 minutes 
of physical activity a day, whether it's a good walk at a good pace. I'm not trying to say you have to go to the gym and do two hours weightlifting. That's not the kind of exercise. I think any exercise that can help lower your sugar, increase your metabolism and help the lipids to whatever. I think 45 minutes a day of good, good, reasonable physical exercise is very important. You know, the reason I'm saying this is that there are studies and I'm happy you know, to, to send you some of these studies. In fact, I have a very good chapter that talks about this. I'll send it to you. The only thing, I don't have the prerogative to distribute it to anyone because it's uh, published by uh, Springer. So this publishing company has the rights for that. But I'm happy to share it with you. Oh, I and would you love the way you find out that some of your viewers may want to find it. What I'm trying to say is if you have an active lifestyle and you have a good a good diet, and when I say a good diet, I'm not going to just say a Mediterranean, but a good diet is a balanced diet, not rich in one thing, but not another. You have to have a balanced diet. And if you reduce your alcohol consumption and you don't smoke, you're going to end up repairing and fixing the damage that you're going to reduce your inflammation. You're going to improve your sugar metabolism. You're going to improve your insulin secretion and sensitivity. You're going to balance your lipids, cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and all those things that people scare you. And just losing 15% of your body weight, because hopefully you're going to be losing fat, you're going to reduce your risk of metabolic syndrome and diabetes, but your testosterone levels are going to go up by 15 to 20%. And you're going to go back to the normal range. Doing that, you know you improved your vascular health. And once you improve your vascular, you're actually improving your sexual health and in particular your erectile function. This is not uh, something brought from the air. There's absolutely real studies published on obesity and erectile function, diabetes and erectile function, Mediterranean diet and erectile function. So this, there are a lot, a lot of studies on this issue. So a good lifestyle and exercise with reduced alcohol consumption and no smoking does a wonder. Unfortunately, here's the problem. People want a miracle and they want it now. It's not an electrical switch. You turn it on, you see the light, you turn it off, the light goes off. This takes time, this takes patience. You have to be resilient, you have to be patient, but you will see the rewards at the end. But if you don't do that, unfortunately, we are in a culture where we want to pop a pill and feel good. Unfortunately, that works sometimes, doesn't work other times. I think we have to discipline ourselves and say, you know what? What if I take 45 minutes of my busy time and do some exercise? What if I make sure I have a healthy breakfast, a good lunch, a reasonable dinner, and cut down on all the things which are unnecessary and get some good sleep, reduce my stress? You're gonna find yourself in a better situation, no question about it, especially with sexual function. Thank you for wrapping up our session with that. The point I'm trying to say is guys, you know, if you're starting to have some symptoms of low testosterone, and the main thing is you're fatigued, you're tired, and you're feeling less libido, less desire, and your erection is not as good, and you're not sleeping well, it's even moodiness, those are the symptoms that you can notice. You, you don't notice the symptoms of like, you know, weak bones or anything like that, but you're trying to notice that, hey, you go to the gym, but yet you're not getting the muscle, you still got that belly fat, which is a sign that you're low testosterone, it can even start as early as in your 20s, you have a lot of stress. If you're vaping, you're not sleeping, you're playing video games, you're not exercising, and you're just eating processed food. Yeah, you can have it as early as in your 20s, but there are things that you can do naturally. It doesn't cost you anything by eating more healthy, even just walking. Go now walking Mother Nature about 30 minutes a day and sleep deep seven hours and stress reduction. But if you exercise and if you go outside mother nature, that's actually a stress reduction in itself. And if you sleep, that's a, also a stress reduction in itself. I also want to point out that your testicle make testosterone when you're asleep as well. If you're asleep, you're actually allowing your testicle to make testosterone. So having said that, I thought we covered completely testosterone and dispel the myth and touch upon women as well too. And I want to end up by thanking you for being here with us today and delivering value. Do you have any last minute word for our viewers? The last word I have for our viewer is that the one thing you have in life is your health, not the money, not the real estate, not whatever. First and foremost, 
your health. If you don't have your health, you have nothing. But if you have your health, you have everything. And therefore, you should take it as the real investment that you need to take in your physical health, mental health, sexual health, whatever. And to do that, there's not a simple thing that fixes everything. You really have to ask yourself if you need to see your primary care or your urologist or your cardiologist or whoever or your gynecologist, you should see because you don't want to not take care of yourself. When it comes how best you do that, you should have an honest, frank and open conversation with your physician. And if your physician sounds like, you know what, let's not worry about it, it's all in your head, I think it's time to look for a second opinion. That's my view. I taught in medical school. I love our clinical system. Our clinicians work very hard. I'm not saying anything negative about that. All I want to say is that only you should have the final word on your health. You should not leave it to someone else to make a decision for you. You have to make that decision and you should make it with your doctor. Hopefully he or she is open-minded and competent and willing to discuss and give and take. The other thing, I know it's not easy, it's not easy to educate yourself trying to read the clinical literature top and bottom, but a podcast like this should help you open your eyes and your mind. You know what? I can get that. I can look for some resources and help educate myself to better manage my well-being and my life. That's my message to your audience. Well, thank you. I appreciate that as well, too. So having said that, Professor Trish, I'm honored that you are here on our podcast. We talk about a lot of good issues and we'll, I will put the resources in the show notes. And if our viewers want to find out more about you, how to connect with you, what would be the best way for them to find out more about you and connect with you? I'm going to be very sincere. I am not going to lie to anyone. I don't do any social media of anything. I am not on any social media platform, so you will never find me on social media. Would I respond if it's a reasonable question? Would I respond by email? Yes, I will. That's the only thing I can tell you. I'm happy to respond, but if you send me a 10-page email, I'm sure I'm not going to be able to respond to a 10-page email. But if there is one or two question that you really want an answer to those, I'm sincerely happy to do that. I don't have any problem at all. I don't well, have I, any problem. Yeah, I, I want to mention that Dr. Trish is current president still of the Andrology Society, and they just had a big meeting last week, which I'm sorry I couldn't attend. I had a family wedding, and so he is a very credible source on all the research based on erectile dysfunction and testosterone. So I will put the Traverse trial in the show notes. So thank you for being with us. And Modern Man, I will see you in the next episode. Are you struggling and frustrated in finding a solution for ED? Well, I have just the thing for you. It's called the Modern Man Club, led by yours truly, Dr. Ann. Together, we're redefining male sexuality and embracing a holistic approach to overcoming ED without medication or surgery. I will provide a protective environment for a community and proven strategy to overcoming ED. It is a safe place, expert coaching by me and my team. We provide holistic approach to overcoming ED and an empowering community of men with ED supporting one another and lots and lots of educational resources. Visit mensexualityclub.com at the link here on my right and connect with us and reclaim control over your sexual health. I'll see you there. Thanks for listening to the Sexual Health for Men podcast. If you love this episode, then please take a screenshot on your phone and post it on Facebook, Instagram, or wherever you post. And be sure to tag me and let me know why you like this episode and what you like to hear in the future. That will help me know what's great for you, and I would love to give you the most incredible free gift designed to help you improve performance quickly. 
go to my website at sexualhealthformenpodcast.com to get the book, The Five Common Costly Mistakes Men Make When Facing ED. I would appreciate it if you subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, and just know that you can have sexual vitality for life. I appreciate you. Until next time.